Okay. So when programming, we construct a mapping model of a certain task, and then we try to encode this task for the machine. And the computational model that we choose determines how large the gap is that our encoding needs to cross. So choosing the appropriate computational model is actually key for success in programming. Okay, so the question is, what kind of computational model is desirable? What matches our mental model? Now, Pin and Myers conducted a very interesting study regarding this topic. In this study, they let non-programmers describe the rule of the game Pac-Man. And this chart over there visualizes uh, the overall style of programming that the participants use. And interestingly, the majority of statements were reactive. So, regular programming concepts seem kind of beneficial for our computational model. So the question now is, what kind of concepts do we have available uh, when we try to actually match those kind of reactive semantics? And the answer is that there's a huge zoo of reactive programming concepts out there. So I have uh, events, I have signals, constraints, actors, streams, stuff like that. And all those concepts have very different working principles and are designed to tackle various different use cases. And therefore, they also have fairly different trails. And despite this variety, they all work the same. Uh, the implementation of reactive programming concepts usually consists of two parts, change detection and the reaction to change. So change detection is responsible for monitoring the dependencies for interesting events and state changes. And when such a change is detected, the reactive part gets notified. This part then defines how to propagate the change consistently throughout the system. And there are numerous ways uh, to do so. So for example, I could simply invoke some kind of callbacks or automatically update some kind of data structures, or I simply alternate the behavior of uh, some uh, objects in accordance to the change. So uh, the concrete reactive behavior is subject to the very uh, concept that uh, we are dealing with. And therefore, the reaction is usually seen as the heart of a reactive programming concept. Um, it's also uh, the part that is uh, of actual visual, visible functionality for the user. So you could say that it's the interesting part. And this talk will focus on the other part, change detection. So in contrast to the reaction, change detection, change detection remains hidden um, to the application programmer. So it's not important whether your change is detected by some clever implicit lifting or uh, by some kind of reflection mechanism. And so this part is often perceived as just another implementation detail because the detection part serves no inherent concept-specific uh, purpose. Instead, it's conceptually exchangeable. And while this is true, change detection has a major limiting impact on practical implementations of regular programming concepts. So to illustrate this, let's take a look at an example. And as a running example, I want to use reactive object queries here. So reactive object queries have a very simple idea. They provide like utility to data structures, namely to sets. So normal object queries allow you to ask your program for all objects in the program space that fulfills a certain condition. So for example, if I want to get all unfinished tasks in my system, then I just select all tasks that are not yet done. And this gives us a nice and convenient way to specify sets in a declarative manner without the effort of manually constructing those sets. Now what makes this concept reactive is that these groups automatically update uh, when the underlying system state changes. So for example, if I finish my class A, then it no longer fulfills the condition of being a to-do. And therefore it's automatically removed from the group. Now by making object queries reactive, uh, our declarative groups are now always consistent with the underlying system state. So, you see, this concept is quite simple. Let's uh, take a look at how tedious it actually is to implement this. So, the reactive part uh, of reactive object queries is actually pretty straightforward to implement. Whenever um, we see that some item updated, then we just check the condition for this particular item again and update its group membership accordingly. So, pretty simple. However, the change detection part is actually far more challenging. And uh, we take a look here at the uh, JavaScript implementation of reactive object queries. Okay, and uh, also the following um, explanation is just a quick excerpt so that you uh, get a rough impression about what's going on and what we actually have to deal with. 
Okay, so the change detection is responsible for detecting any change that might affect uh, the condition for a certain item. And this means that we need to set up some kind of dependency um, of reactive mechanism to observe our dependencies. Okay, so as we are in JavaScript, uh, our condition can include like any uh, kind of JavaScript code. And this means that we have to deal with uh, vessel calls, with dynamically typed objects, with encapsulation, with polymorphism, all this stuff. And therefore, there's no like easy way to determine those dependencies uh, right away. So, in order to uh, identify these dependencies, we perform a dynamic interpretation of the uh, condition parameterized with the uh, specific instance. Okay, but um, to interpret the function, the used uh, JavaScript and JavaScript interpreter requires access to the local scope of this function. And unfortunately, JavaScript does uh, not provide computational access to such a scope. And therefore, we now have to manually identify the scope and then provide explicitly for the uh, interpreter. Okay, so uh, when we have the interpreter up and running, we want to identify all object members that we visit during the interpretation of the condition. And therefore, we actually need to adapt the behavior of the used interpreter to intercept these member accesses. And this means that we now have to understand the interpreter library and extend it at the <coughs> Now, whenever uh, we uh, visit an object member, we install a transparent property accessor for this particular member. So a property accessor is a um, basic yeah, reflection uh, mechanism in JavaScript that allows us to intercept later assignments to a particular property. So, um, but the problem is that property accessors are pretty low level. They only work on one particular uh, field of an object. And this means that our next housekeeping item is to actually map between changes from uh, observed by a property accessor to our high-level view of groups and uh, conditions. Um, and since we are in an uh, object-oriented language, we also have to deal with uh, structural change that might occur. So, uh, for example, when we assign a complex object uh, to a uh, monitor property, we have to update our dependencies to actually get new kind of uh, observations also. Another thing that we have to handle is the interaction with other concepts that make use of the very same uh, metaprogramming facilities that we do. So, for example, if another concept uses also uh, property accessors, we have to integrate with them as well. And finally, um, we have to deal with browser-specific implementations. So, for example, uh, when you try to um, apply a property accessor on a length attribute of an array, then Firefox simply raises an error while Chrome just ignores it. Okay, so we have to take care of all those uh, issues in order to implement reactive object queries in JavaScript based on uh, reflection. So, why is this so tedious? <coughs> Um, the first thing is that we have to implement a uh, vertical slice through multiple layers of abstractions from our high level view of like objects, uh, groups, and uh, our conditions down all the way to browser specifics. And those browser specifics are really not that interesting at all for our concept developers. The next thing is that change detection mechanisms uh, are usually not intended for reuse. Instead, they are tightly coupled together with the reactive uh, part in order to maximize expressiveness and performance. The third thing is that the presented approach, uh, for example, is very limited. You can just detect changes to object properties, but not to, for example, local variables or global variables. And uh, the concept of reactive uh, object queries actually allows you to do so, but the implementation not, uh, does not, so we have some kind of mismatch here. Okay, so we saw that uh, change detection can actually be uh, really tedious. Now, um, the goal of our work was to ease the development of reactive programming paradigms. And uh, we also tried to uh, do that for non-experts or non-language like, developers. So we have to kind of tackle this change detection part. And our idea here is to identify and then exploit similarities within existing reactive programming concepts. <coughs> Okay, so what we found was a subset of reactive programming concepts that share very uh, similar uh, change detection mechanisms. Uh, we call the subset state-based <coughs> reactive programming concepts. Uh, state-based reactive concepts. Um, and the criteria here is that the users 
of the concept specifies the dependency implicitly as an expression over the program state. So uh, all those concepts, all those state-based reactive concepts, share expressions as a common ground for change detection. Now what makes this uh, subset of particular interest uh, for us is that those uh, implicitly defined dependencies are actually one of the harder change detection mechanisms to actually implement. Okay, so what kind of concepts belong to this category? Um, there's a whole bunch. So uh, I already presented you the uh, basic concept of reactive object queries, where you like collect all objects that fulfill a given condition. And uh, in this case, uh, this condition is um, the expression that defines implicit dependencies. And a uh, popular reactive programming concept that also falls into this category are signals. So when I define a signal, I introduce a functional dependency in my program so that the signal variable always represents the value of the given expression. And the signal definition is, uh, in this case, again, the expression that defines our dependencies implicitly. And there are a whole bunch of other concepts that also belong to this category. Now, when you look at in, uh, existing implementations of those concepts, you re will realize that they are quite diverse. So, for example, a popular way to implement signals is uh, using implicit lifting, or you could add constraint programming capabilities to your imperative languages by alternating the underlying VM. Or, as we saw with reactive object queries, uh, we, uh, there was a combination of like dynamic interpretation and metaprogramming used. So. They uh, have all quite different working principles, but in the end, all of those uh, concepts uh, do the same. So they're all monitor some kind of expressions. The expression just represents something different each time. <coughs> so why should we re-implement uh, those concepts over and over again uh, if they solve the similar tasks? So the idea here is to actually redefine this community into a reusable primitive, which we then call active expressions. Okay, so uh, what we're doing here is we like apply basic engineering principles, but not on code. We do this on concepts. So uh, instead of like extracting a method, we extract a concept, and then we try to reify this concept in a reusable manner. And this actually allows us to describe and implement uh, state-based reactive concepts in terms of this reusable primitive. Okay. So we want this uh, active expressions to be a basic reactive programming concepts that allow us to build other concepts on top of it. And uh, before I go into how these actually look like, uh, I want to clarify our goals here. So the overarching goal is to uh, relieve the concept developers from the recurring chore of change detection by hiding the implementation details uh, behind the unified expression, expressions in our uh, case. Um, second thing is that we want to allow for a variety of concepts uh, to be actually built on top of active expressions. The, this means that we actually uh, have to make the least amount of uh, assumptions on the behavior of those reactive programming concepts. And the third thing is that we want to integrate well with object-oriented environments. The reason here is simply that a large uh, amount of code is actually written in those object-oriented environments. So when you build your concept on top of active expressions, you immediately have access to all uh, those code, uh, to all this functionality. So this means that you can apply your new ideas to uh, the existing stuff and to a more elaborate use case rather than some um, yeah, for examples. Okay, so um, the first thing that we did is we make active expressions itself a state-based reactive programming concept. And this means that um, we detect changes based on a given expression and then we uh, react to that change in some way. Okay, so the first goal was to relieve the programmer from this tedious task of change detection. This means uh, that we need to like, accept any kind of <coughs> expression, regardless what they actually represent. Um, so, for example, if uh, uh, the concept on top uh, can now actually just dedicate this expression to us, and uh, this means that automatically all those implementation details are hidden for you. So, uh, for example, if you want to implement a very simple variant of signals, then you can just uh, give us the like signal definition to monitor them. Okay, and in code it might look like this. You have your um, signal that should uh, be equal to some kind of expression, and what you then just do is you use this signal defining expression and create a new active expression with it. 
And this means that we actually monitor this now for you. Okay, our second goal was to uh, allow for a variety of concepts to build on top of active expressions. And this means that we simply do not assume like any kind of behavior, but instead we treat the um, yeah, we treat the behavior as just another point of variation. So this means that um, active expressions are very simple, so not a super elaborate concept, but therefore it's also very general. Okay, so how does it work? Well, we, you basically can apply like any kind of uh, callback for active expressions. And um, then these uh, callbacks are called every time that the evaluation result of your expression changes. Okay, so to continue our signal implementation, uh, whenever this uh, signal defining expression changes, then uh, we just assign this new value to our uh, signal variable. And uh, now we uh, can also take a bit uh, more of initial setup, for example, assigning the initial value of uh, our expression to this uh, variable <coughs> that we already have implemented a simple version of signals. And now we can like, provide some kind of source code transformation from that to write. Okay, so in general, you provide us some description of the state that you are interested in, and uh, your reactive behavior gets executed every time the uh, evaluation result of the given expression changes. Okay, uh, so let's apply this to our initial example of reactive object graphs. So we had this like uh, group membership that depends on the uh, condition. And uh, when implementing this with uh, active expression, the change detection is actually reduced to this uh, simple method over here. So uh, what we do is whenever we uh, get a new instance from this class, the on new instance method is called. And um, this means that we now have to monitor our condition for this instance. Uh, which means we just uh, ask uh, the active expression for uh, monitoring the condition, parameterize with this item, and then whenever this becomes true, we add it to the group, and whenever it becomes false, we remove it from the group. And so we uh, simply keep uh, the group membership and the underlying system state in sync. Okay, so to evaluate whether active expression, expressions actually represent a reusable primitive, we implemented a number of different concepts using uh, yeah, our um, concept. And so we implemented signals, we implemented a uh, yeah, reactive variant of the, the local, uh, of the linear constraint solving library Castleberry, we implemented reactive object queries, which I already described, and we also implemented implicit layer activation, which is an activation means used in context-oriented programming. And so um, if you look at those concepts, they actually have fairly different uh, kinds of behavior that they uh, apply, so active expressions can indeed support a variety of uh, behavior. So, uh, first of all, we wanted to know um, whether we actually, whether our first goal, so uh, relieving the programmer from the recurring chore of change detection, actually worked. So, is our code now simpler? Um, and therefore, we implemented a reference implementation for each of those concepts <coughs> and evaluated them uh, against it, against uh, our active expression based implementation. So uh, we simply use the number of AST nodes uh, to measure the kind of complexity that uh, the implementation has. And also we broke this down into the detection part and the reaction part. And uh, what you can actually see is that we uh, can indeed have an impact on the change detection part. However, uh, also interesting to note is that um, this reactive part is like a lower bound for us. So we uh, active expressions do not tackle this at all. So this is like a natural law about. Okay, so let's sum this up. Um, our goal is to ease the implementation of novel reactive programming concepts. And therefore, we identified a commonality within existing reactive programming concepts. We then reified this commonality into a reusable base concept, active expressions. And with these active expressions, we can now um, yeah, reason about reactive programming concepts in a unified manner and also implement them easier. Thank you. Um, so, can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, how this is implemented? Is that uh, oh, uh, back into Yeah, of course. Okay, 
Um, so there are numbers of uh, ways that uh, we could actually use to uh, implement them. So we could like uh, use a customized VM, we could uh, do some meta programming or alternating the compilation process, or it simply uses some kind of conventions and guidelines like extra scripting would be. Okay. Um, and the issue here is that um, all of those concepts uh, have their yeah, <coughs> strengths and weaknesses. So, um, and the problem is that uh, we want to provide a base concept. So, we don't know in which kind of uh, usage scenario the concepts that are built on top of the expressions are actually used. So, um, what we do, uh, what we did, was okay. Uh, so what we did is we actually uh, said, hey, this uh, uh, the strategy that you actually use, this is also variable. So um, when you build uh, on top of active expressions, you can also choose which kind of implementation you would like uh, to do. And uh, okay, um, this is why this is important. And um, so, for example, we uh, implemented our prototype in JavaScript, which means that the customized VM is like a no-go. So, because JavaScript uh, is like intended to uh, run in a variety of clients, and for each of those uh, other three uh, mechanisms, we each implemented an um, example. More questions? Are there any issues with um, consistency or ambiguity where? Uh, something changes, which invokes a callback, which changes it back, so that some other callback that hasn't happened yet is affected, or anything like that? Uh, yeah, of course, you can build like infinite loops. But uh, is it easy to specify what will happen, or, or is there problems with having a, a reliable specification? It's a kind of race, race condition, right? So I'm wondering if it's hard to specify. So glitches. Yeah, glitches. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, glitches, for example, uh, are, in my opinion, um, subject to the reactive part. So, uh, not to the change detection part. Because you define how uh, your changes are actually propagated throughout the system. And uh, therefore, I would say that uh, this is <coughs> up to the user of uh, our concept, but not of us. Can there be such a change that, like, one change actually means multiple of your active expressions tell you there's a change? Yeah. And is, is there a way to possibly have, like, consistency over these then? Uh, what do you mean by consistency? So, uh, in the sense of victory, for instance, like, do five active expressions now tell me, hey, there's a change, and I don't have a clue if they're related or not, or is there some way to correlate these? If they happen from the same, like, actual change to one object or another? Ah, okay. So uh, currently, um, how, uh, yeah, what kind of uh, reactive behavior is called is up to you. So uh, if you, for example, say, hey, uh, I, I don't know, um, I monitor the same local variable five times, and when you then just say, hey, the, uh, uh, the reactive behavior, which is just a function, hey, these are all correlated, then of course you see that they are correlated. 